There is nothing that you have to get in order to be happy. Happiness is your innate nature. It's inbuilt into you. It's part of your DNA. If happiness is my innate nature, then how come I'm not experiencing my innate nature? How come I'm experiencing my life sucks? When you get up in the morning, does your blood sing at the thought of being who you are and doing what you do? As you go through the day, do you come radiantly alive, if not all the time, at least for a good chunk of each day? Can you fall to your knees at involuntary gratitude, the tremendous good fortune that has been bestowed on you? If that is not your experience of life, then I humbly suggest that you are wasting your life. And it is possible for that to be your experience of life. And I'm going to share with you some deep teachings which will get you there. These teachings will probably contradict everything that you believe about life and what it's all about. Are you ready to take that journey? Yay, okay. <clears throat> we want to be happy. We want those around us to be happy. We want our children to be happy. When parents are surveyed and asked, what would you like your child to be? Happy is mentioned more often than all of the other responses combined. So what do you need to get in order to be happy? Vast wealth, trophy spouse, power, fame? I want you to consider that whatever you get, you can unget. Vast wealth in the old days, if you were a millionaire, that was pretty good. These days, if you're a millionaire, you feel positively lower middle class. So let's assume you've got the kind of wealth where you have a mansion, where you need a golf cart to go to the dining room. Uh, you have your private jet, your super yachts. But remember, whatever you get, you can unget. You have a super yacht, the super yacht can disappear. Many oligarchs have discovered that off late. So, I'm suggesting something different for you. There is nothing that you have to get in order to be happy. Happiness is your innate nature. It's inbuilt into you. It's part of your DNA. Now, you're a very polite audience, but doubtless many of you are thinking what you're not asking, which is, if happiness is my innate nature, then how come I'm not experiencing my innate nature? How come I'm experiencing my life sucks? And the short answer to that is, you have spent your entire life learning to be unhappy. Let me repeat that. You have spent your entire life learning to be unhappy. And the way you learn to be unhappy is by buying into a particular mental model. And that mental model says, I have to get something so I can do something, so I can be something. So I have to get a great deal of money so I can go to exotic places on vacation so I can be happy. I have to be in a relationship so I can have great sex so I can be happy. All of this is part of the if-then model. And the if-then model basically says, if this happens, then I will be happy. And we believe so strongly in it. If only I got promoted, if I had more money, if I had a bigger house, if my in-laws would move to Australia, if my kid would get into Harvard, if my kid would get into Harvard and my neighbor's kid did not make it to any of the IVs, if this happens, then I will be happy. 
And when it doesn't work, we always say we put the wrong thing on the if side of the equation. I thought if I got married, I would be happy. I now recognize I married the wrong person. So I have to extricate myself from it with as little financial damage as possible and marry the right person, and then I will be happy. No matter how many times it doesn't work out, we never question the model itself. We always question, what did we put on the if side of the equation? Now, I said happiness is your real nature. Don't take my word for it. Can any of you recall seeing a scene of such spectacular beauty that it took you outside of yourself to a place of great calm and serenity? Perhaps a rainbow, a beautiful valley, a snow-covered mountaintop. All of you recall something like that? Why did that happen? That happened because somehow Inexplicably, at that instant, you accepted the universe exactly as it was. You didn't want anything to change. You didn't say, that's a beautiful rainbow, but it's way off to one side. If I could move it 200 yards to the right, it would be so much better. You didn't say, that's a beautiful valley, but the tree in the foreground has too many crooked branches. You give me a chainsaw in 20 minutes and I'll fix it. Oh no, the off-center rainbow was fine, the tree with the crooked branches was fine, and the moment you accepted it, your habitual wanting self dropped away, and you experienced the joy that was an innate part of you. And I'm suggesting to you right now that your life, with all of the problems you have, is every bit as perfect. Your life all now, right now with all of the problems you think you have is every bit as perfect. But you're striving with might and main to change one or more parts of it. And in doing so, you're buying into the if-then model. And the if-then model, as I pointed out, is flawed. That's how we learn to be unhappy. But remember, your innate nature is happiness, and we will come back to that in a couple of minutes. Let me share another concept with you. This one comes from Aristotle. Aristotle posited that for every item, there is a material cause and an efficient cause. So let's say we have a pot. What's the pot made of? Clay. That's the material cause. Who made it? The potter. That's the efficient cause. So there was clay, and the potter made the pot out of clay. There's a gold ornament. What's the gold ornament made of? Gold. Who made it? The goldsmith made it. So the goldsmith is the efficient cause. The ornament is the item, and gold is the material cause. OK? All right. So now we have this huge item. We have the universe with billions of galaxies. And each of those galaxies is billions of stars. We have this huge, huge item. Who made this item? Well, God. God made this item. Okay, so God is the efficient cause. What did God make this universe out of? Well, there was this quantum soup lying around. It made the you know, universe out of quantum soup. All right. Who made the quantum soup? Do you understand that you get into an infinite regress on this? There's only one way out of the regress. God made the universe out of himself, herself, itself. Which means everything around you, the chair in which you're sitting, the microphone through which I'm speaking, the stage, all God's stuff. The great men of history, Lincoln, Gandhi, God's stuff. The evil tyrants of history, Hitler, Stalin, God's stuff. There is nothing in the world. There will be nothing in the world. There has been nothing in the world that is not God's stuff. Hold that down. That's point number two. Now, what would you call a scientist who arbitrarily throws away a quarter of his findings. You wouldn't have a lot of respect for that person's integrity, right? 
with you are equally bad. And let me explain. Supposing someone were to ask you to describe yourself, who are you? You'd say something like, oh, you know, I'm John, I'm a software engineer, and I used to like my job, but now I don't like my job so much, and my marriage is kind of rocky, I don't know if it'll survive. But let's assume you go to bed at night. And when you go to bed at night, you're Julius Caesar. And there's this guy Pompey who's trying to be dictator of Rome, and you want to be dictator of Rome, so you take your legions and you fight with Pompey, and you pursue him to far lands, and you land up in Egypt, and there's this woman called Cleopatra who's having a bit of a difficulty with her brother, and you side with her and get her the throne of Egypt and defeat her brother, and you have an affair, or you have a child, and then you go back to Rome, and the Ides of March happen. And in the Ides of March, Brutus sticks his knife in you, and that really hurts, and it hurts so much that you wake up. And then you realize that you created everything. You created the Roman Empire, you created Pompeii, you created the deserts, you created Cleopatra and a brother. But having created all of this, you identified with a small part of it, the part called Julius Caesar. You created everything, but you identified with a small part of it, Julius Caesar. And when do you discover this? You discover this when you wake up. I am suggesting to you that the life that you're remaining in right now is every bit like that. It is not real. It is a dream. Here is the model that you're using. There is this enormous universe. There's billions of galaxies. Each of these galaxies has billions of stars. The Milky Way is one small insignificant galaxy. The sun is one small insignificant star in this insignificant galaxy. And in that there are planets. And in one of those planets, the third out from the sun, there is land masses. In one of those land masses there are countries. And in the countries there are towns. And one of them is Cologne. And you're in there and you're occupying a body and your mind is in that. So it's a very, very, very tiny part. Wrong. You've got it completely backwards. It is your mind that is immense because the entire galaxy, the entire universe is contained in your mind. Let me repeat that. The entire universe, the entire galaxy is contained in your mind. But you do not recognize this and you identify with a particular body-mind complex and you say, this is who I am, I'm John the software engineer. You're lying. Because if someone were to ask you, who are you, would you say, well, some of the time I'm John the software engineer, but some of the time I'm Julius Caesar, and some of the time there's this blank and I just vanish. You're a liar. Let us define real as that which always is. Only that is real which always is. So if only that is real which always is, then John the software engineer is not real because some of the times he disappears and becomes Julius Caesar and some of the times he just vanishes. Julius Caesar is not real because he's there some of the time but some of the time he's John the software engineer and some of the time he just disappears. So what is it that is always there that never goes away? What is always there and never goes away is your awareness that you exist. I am. When you get up from deep sleep, do you have to ask someone, hey, did I exist? No. You know you existed. That awareness that you are is the only reality. The notion that you are John the software engineer is every bit as much a fiction as Julius Caesar. So your mistake
mistaken assumption that your John the software engineer is responsible for your sense of separation and that in turn is responsible for all of the sorrow in your life. Because when you recognize that you are pure awareness and that is your real nature, then you recognize, remember what I said, there is nothing in the world that is not God's stuff. Never has been, never can be. That is your awareness. And when you are rooted in that, you don't want things to be different because there is nothing else. There is only you. There is only awareness. All the rest is like an enormous soap opera, a drama that is playing out. And you can have tremendous fun if you are looking at the drama and enjoying it. But if you identify with the drama and if you identify with a character in the drama, then all the suffering comes in. So there is no I, there is no you. That is the friction, that is part of the dream that you are all enmeshed in. And the objective of life is to recognize that it is a dream, to recognize that your real nature is awareness. In India, we have a term. We call this Satchidananda, existence, consciousness, bliss. Because when you're in there, you look upon the world, and it is a soap opera playing out, and it is tremendously enjoyable, and you enjoy every part of it. But you recognize that it is a drama, and in the drama, there will be high notes, low notes, there will be tragedy, and every bit of it is as enjoyable as every other bit of it. You do not want things to be different. You simply immerse yourself in the joy of simply being. Because the purpose of life is not to be this or that. The purpose of life is to be. And my sincere hope is that every single one of you who is on this journey will eventually wake up to this body-mind-intellect complex is not really me. I've inhabited it for whatever reason. I'm going to enjoy it. But I am deathless. I'm immortal. I am pure spirit. And I sincerely wish that for all of you. Thank you. Thank you.